Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, almost good afternoon. Welcome to CDOP. Welcome uh, to the Barcelona Center for International Affairs. It's a real pleasure to open this uh, discussion on migration challenges in Europe, a conversation we will be sharing first and foremost with uh, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Antonio Vitorino, whom I will introduce um, in, the, in, in, in a couple of minutes. But let me first thank all those who are following us from home, um, this uh, online live discussion uh, in the framework of the EU IDEA project. EU IDEA is a Horizon 2020 project funded by the European Union, uh, on which we've had the pleasure to collaborate in the last few years in the framework of the work package on the area of freedom, security, and justice, with a particular emphasis on migration issues. We've been uh, carrying uh, this work forward for the last few years, analyzing the state of play of uh, migration challenges at the European Union, but also, and more in particular, in the framework of your idea on differentiated integration and how can differentiated integration provide uh, good uh, and, and effective ways to tackling migration challenges. And this is where our uh, online discussion today um, will elaborate on. We will be uh, having a keynote uh, speech, as I mentioned before, but then we will continue with a discussion with many, uh, with a few researchers involved in the working um, process of, of EU IDEA on this uh, particular uh, work package who will elaborate on the first insights that, um, that Mr. Vitorino will, will share with us. I am joined here at CIDOP both by uh, Blanca Garces, who's our research coordinator at CIDOP, but also um, head of the Migrations Department at, at CIDOP, and uh, with Emmanuel Comte, who's a, a senior research fellow at, at CIDOP, and who has been leading the work of our institution in the framework of UIDEA in the last uh, few years. So for us, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to CIDOP, um, the Barcelona Center for International Affairs, and let me extend a uh, very warm welcome to Antonio Vitorino, our keynote speaker uh, today. Antonio Vitorino, as I mentioned, is the Director General of the International Organization for Migration since 2018. Um, he's been in office in, in, in his capacity following a previous appointment at the PRODI Commission, at the European Commission, as Commissioner for Justice and Home Affairs for 1999 to 2004, and before that, having uh, multiple roles at, the, uh, at his home country in, um, in, in Portugal as Deputy Prime Minister and as a Minister of National uh, Defense from 1995 to 1997. So a person who is very well suited to discuss both a national perspective on migration challenges but also, most importantly, also a European perspective given uh, his uh, trajectory in the framework of the European Commission and today in an international organization such as the IOM, uh, which uh, he is heading uh, very effectively and with a very uh, strong uh, interest on the, on the migration challenges in Europe and beyond. So without further ado, uh, from my side, Again, a warm welcome, uh, Mr. Antonio Vitorino. The floor is all yours for this keynote speech, and then we will move to a discussion on the basis of your uh, introduction. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And when it comes to uh, assuming the need for public policies to address the challenges of uh, migration, you cannot draft policies if you ignore the realities, but at the same time, you need to incorporate in your policies the perceptions of the public opinion, no matter how distant they are from the reality. And nobody can dispute the fact that uh, since 2015, the European member states have attributed a legitimate uh, priority to external border controls. It's a crucial issue, not just to guarantee the integrity of the territory of the European Union member states, but it's also relevant because, in fact, the more you can consolidate and guarantee the well-functioning of the external borders of the European Union, the better you are reinforcing 
the functioning of the Schengen area and above all the internal space without barriers. But having uh, said that, I cannot hide from you that uh, uh, in a number of cases and a growing number of cases, we are seeing some practices at the European Union external borders that are of utmost con concern. We register an increase in the number of bush pushbacks in the external borders of several European Union member states. Pushbacks are illegal. They uh, deprive people from the opportunity to claim for asylum. They are against the international humanitarian law. So we need to uh, recognize that the, there is a way of strengthening the controls at the external borders, uh, totally aligned with the, the international obligations of the European member states and according to international humanitarian uh, law. A second issue of concern is the situation in the Mediterranean. If we look to the situation in the different parts of the Mediterranean, we can conclude that uh, the pandemic has had an uneven impact in the flows towards Europe. There is a significant drop of arrivals in the Eastern Mediterranean towards the Greek islands, less 80% in 2020 when compared to previous years, but there is a rise in the number of arrivals to Italy uh, three times more in 2020 than in 2019. The figures concerning the arrivals to Europe in the Western Mediterranean in 2020 were more or less at the same level as 2019, roughly 18,000 people arriving. And uh, what is on the rise is the so-called Atlantic route. People coming from West Africa arriving to the Canary Islands through one of the most dangerous routes in the world. And uh, there has been an increase of the number of arrivals to the Canary Islands in 2020 that persists in 2021. So the pandemic has had an even, an, even, an even effect in the movement of people and we are very much concerned with the fact that there is a, a lack of capacity and of priority in setting up the necessary safe and rescue mechanisms to guarantee that the people uh, do not die in the Mediterranean. And the figures about death in the Mediterranean this year are extremely disturbing. They are uh, three times more than last, uh, than last year. And of course, when we address the challenges in a crisis mood, we need to recognize that the recent events in Afghanistan have uh, reinstated that uh, mood of perception of crisis that uh, is uh, the dominant in a number of uh, European Union uh, member states. And uh, that's why uh, we consider that uh, if we do not address the deep root causes of the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan, we indeed cannot discard the possibility of having uh, major outflows in the near future. But the, the, for the moment, we do not see any major massive departures from uh, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, we insist on the need to address the situation of the entire region uh, to make sure that uh, we reduce uh, the factors that can trigger major departures uh, from uh, uh, Afghanistan. And sec on a different layer, we need to learn from the lessons of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, I think that it is fair to recognize that uh, in a number of European member states, migrant workers, whether in the health sector or in the home care uh, sector, have played a key role in the fight against the pandemic, but not just in the health sector. 
they have also been on the front line during the lockdowns in the European member states in making sure that the groceries were working, that the distribution channels were working, that we could be locked down in our houses, but there was someone to guarantee that we had access to food and to uh, medicines. And to a large extent, those are ex sectors where migrant workers uh, play a key role. Even in some cases, during uh, the crop season, there were waivers for mobility for uh, seasonal migrant workers to make sure that uh, the agricultural sector would go on delivering the necessary goods for us to overcome the pandemic period being locked down at, uh, at home. So those are uh, examples where the concerns of the public opinion need to be addressed by the public policies. But at the same time, the public policies require uh, a strong coordination so that uh, we can address the perceptions, but at the same time, we can address the realities that uh, are sometimes far away from the perceptions. The challenge I see for the future is to make sure that the internal dimension of the European migration policy is coherent and consistent with uh, its uh, external uh, dimension. And this uh, requires, uh, in my opinion, uh, strong cooperation, not just among the European Union member states, but also with countries of origin and countries of uh, transit. I will not elaborate on the internal dimension because uh, it is very clear that the pact on asylum and migration that has been put forward by the European Commission being an opportunity to relaunch a much needed debate about how the member states uh, position themselves in relation to migratory flows and to asylum uh, seekers. Uh, in fact, the, the split among the member states uh, has not allowed too much progress in, uh, in the implementation of such a pact. And uh, if there are some uh, difficulties in the internal debate due to the different positionings of different groups of member states, I believe that it is much easier to get a broader agreement at the level when it comes to the external dimension of uh, migration and asylum policy. But here again, uh, perceptions uh, do not match uh, realities. Uh, in fact, uh, there is uh, a common shared perception in Europe that uh, there are massive flows of migration from the African continent towards Europe. But the, the realities are that uh, in the African continent, 80% of migratory movements are intra-African movements, are from one African country to another African country. From the overall migratory stock coming from Africa, only 16%, one six, 16% are have Europe as uh, their uh, destination. So the links between the European Union and uh, the partners uh, in the neighborhood, whether in the Western Balkans or whether in the Southern part of Europe in relation to Africa needs to be a top priority for an European asylum and uh, migration uh, policy. But we should not be confined to a pure intra-regional dialogue. In fact, the migratory challenges today are universal. And that is, has been recognized by the United Nations in 2018 with the adoption of the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and uh, Regular uh, Migration. The Global Compact is not a legally binding instrument. It's a platform for cooperation among member states, trying to bring together countries of origin, countries of transit, and countries of destination 
in order to guarantee that uh, a well-managed uh, migration is fully respectful of the dignity and of the human rights of migrants, irrespective of their legal status, and at the same time, states cooperate in order to open up opportunities for regular and legal migration, as it has always happened in uh, mankind history. And the Global Compact, being a platform of cooperation, is highly dependent on the willingness of the countries to engage, to cooperate, to share best experiences, and uh, to guarantee that uh, the rights, the fundamental rights of the migrants are fully respected by their own national migration policies. And uh, in the uh, run-up of the um, Global Compact, the United Nations system has created the UN Migration Network, which brings together 38 entities and bodies in the UN system, being coordinated by the International Organization for Migration, in order to guarantee that the entire UN system works uh, with one voice in the support delivered to the member states, member states of origin, member states of transit, member states of destination in uh, identifying the best practices and in drafting their own migration policies and in building the necessary capacity to address uh, uh, global movement. When, when it comes to global movement, I would like to call your attention upon the fact that the pandemic in 2020 and still ongoing uh, has uh, had uh, a major impact on uh, migration. The world has come to a stop. It has never happened before. The closure of the borders, the lockdowns, the re sharp reduction of the number of flights have uh, left uh, migrants uh, stranded in a number of places. IOM uh, estimates that during 2020, more than 3 million migrants that were on the move became stranded, blocked, because of the restrictive measures that have been adopted to fight against the, the pandemic. And the, the collateral and undesirable effect of such measures is seen with the, the evidence that there has been an increase of uh, irregular migration and trafficking in human beings. If people cannot move freely, they will try to move uh, coping with dangerous uh, migratory routes, which put uh, into question their safety and their own uh, integrity. Now we are starting speaking about how to relaunch human mobility worldwide. And uh, in fact, uh, this uh, human mobility will be essential if we want to recover from the economic and social economic impacts of the pandemic. I do believe that there is no possibility of relaunching the global trade if there is no relaunch of global mobility. But there are two very relevant obstacles in this respect. The first one is the uneven distribution of vaccines. Let's be very clear. If the mood in the global north is about how we can relaunch mobility, because the degree of vaccination of the populations is uh, much higher. The reality is that uh, in the global south, at average, we can say that less than 10% of the population has had access to vaccination. And uh, due to the shortage of uh, production and the uneven distribution and access to vaccines, I anticipate that this two-tier system of mobility will persist for quite some time until we have a degree of vaccination in the global south that is equivalent to the degree of vaccination in the global north. Irrespective of the geographical position of the countries, IOM is making the case for having migrants integrated in national vaccination plans. Indeed, if uh, migrants are not included in national vaccination plans, 
they can become bubbles of people that are much more vulnerable to the disease, where the disease can proliferate, can mutate, can impact on the host communities and be a source of discrimination, racism, and xenophobia against migrants. So it's the interest of all, of the entire community to make sure that migrants are fully integrated in national vaccination plans, because as the Secretary General of the United Nations says, no one is safe until everybody is safe. And the second obstacle deals with the need to adapt global mobility to the new health requirements for uh, movement worldwide. And the, the health requirements are being integrated in border controls and in migration management systems. But this will require investments in infrastructures. This will require training uh, and skills upgrading of border guards and migration officials to deal with new health requirements for my, to migrate. And this will also be unevenly shared uh, worldwide. Come wealthy countries uh, will be much more prepared and in a better condition to introduce those health proofing mechanisms in border controls than less wealthy countries, less developed countries. And uh, if we want to relaunch global mobility, we need to guarantee that there is a common level playing field worldwide, not just sharing standards, but also sharing the capacity to implement the, those uh, standards. Therefore, uh, to conclude, I would say that the, the migration agenda remains a top priority in the international agenda. Uh, the challenges are old ones that we know very well, and there are new challenges that we need to cope with. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, the debate that is following now my uh, introductory remarks. Thank you so much once again for the invitation and back to Barcelona. Vitorino, it's been uh, uh, extremely enlightening uh, to to hear your your views on 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 what uh, on what the current challenges are, and and, and then from here, um, and particularly delving a bit deeper into what has been the research done in the framework of EU IDEA in the last few years, and particular in 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 migration aspects in the area of freedom, security, and justice, we will move immediately to our discussion, uh, which is uh, based on, on the different views across Europe on, on a sample of, of research institutes that have been present in the working uh, group of, uh, on migration uh, led by CIDOP. And for that, and let me uh, thank you again for your, for your introductory remarks, I will now give the floor to, to Blanca Garces, who is our research coordinator and, and senior uh, research Fellow on Migrations here uh, at CIDOP to chair the session, but let me also thank very much Emmanuel Comte for uh, having organized this, uh, this event and for having been behind the EU IDEA uh, project in the, last, in the last few years. So for, now I turn to, to Blanca Garces, who will moderate and introduce the different speakers. Blanca, all yours. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vitorino. You raised, as Paul said, many, many important issues. For me, one of the main conclusions of your uh, presentation, the main conclusion is that indeed migration is, uh, is not an easy policy domain. As we experts say, it's full of intractable controversies and you point to, to, to some of them. Uh, perceptions, as you said, do not always correspond to reality. And policy sometimes respond to these perceptions, or at least should address these perceptions. So the question is how policies should address or can address these perceptions and reality at the same time, or put in another way, how can we reconcile perceptions and reality, or with reality? This is one of the main controversies, these intract intractable controversies. The second one I would say is that uh, migrant workers are needed but not always wanted, and the best example here 
is the UK, so how to solve as well this tension. And finally, I would say another question is uh, what happens at the EU borders? Policies do not always comply with our own legislation. So here we have a problem, and this problem as well is linked to the increasing securitization of the EU external borders. So these are some of the issues that you have raised, and I think that we'll come back in the discussion. Let me now introduce the three EU IDEA experts. Uh, first of all, Corinne Ballet from the Jacques Delors Institute. Institute. Corinne, and then Emmanuel Comte from CIDOP, and Katarina Musta-Silta from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. First, Corinne, thanks for being here. I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, I just want to stress before starting uh, that, um, so I, um, yes, I, I uh, worked for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs a few years ago during the uh, immigration crisis on this issue. But uh, today I only speak as a member of the working group of the Institut Jacques Delors. So, uh, and um, so I, I was very impressed by uh, 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 Mr. Antonio Vitorino's uh, speech and his very uh, smart and brilliant uh, presentation of uh, the situation of mi migration issues in the world. Uh, maybe I wish now to focus more on the internal dimension of this uh, topic, uh, which you uh, put aside. Um, I think that uh, so uh, it was clear in 2015, during the, uh, the, the immigration crisis, that the EU would uh, need a reform of its immigration. Uh, pact and uh, system. And uh, the objective of the reform, specifically in the field of asylum, uh, was twofold. First, increasing harmonization in order to limit secondary movement. And second, to uh, increase solidarity uh, with first entry member states. These are the two main issues which are at stake. Uh, however, we are in a situation since 2016 where we are actually experiencing a kind of a disintegration process uh, in EU law regarding migration. If you look at uh, uh, the respect of external border or um, uh, internal movements, also uh, Dublin transfer, a respect of uh, rescue, you spoke about rescue, uh, pushback, uh, also the retaining of internal borders uh, more than uh, two years, uh, in contradiction with the uh, European uh, Schengen border code. So, uh, and at the same time, as you said, the um, the new migration, um, the new pact on migration and asylum seems to be stalled uh, for a few months now. So what could be the possibilities? And I think there are two kinds of possibilities. First of all, it could be possible to, and maybe it would be the first best, to come back to uh, the normal legis legislative procedure in, uh, in, uh, in uh, making decisions regarding uh, immigration issues. Uh, the European Council in June se uh, two se uh, two uh, 2018 decided that the uh, Dublin regulation should be uh, recast only by consensus. But actually, uh, it is uh, tending to legitimize uh, member states which don't want to respect uh, uh, European law, such as uh, relocation decisions or even other uh, regulations. And um, 
so and also I think that uh, the ordinary legislative procedure could force or to give an impetus for member states which would be in a minority to try to find a compromise with the other member states. So it would certainly be a first best to come back to the normal working of uh, the European immigration policy and use the normal legislative procedures. But in reality, it is difficult. Uh, it's true that uh, this decision from the European Council came after uh, a statement that uh, it was blocked, this, uh, this reform was blocked. And the second best is looking for um, flexibilities in uh, and um, flexibilities in um, in uh, in the European immigration policy. So flexibilities, actually there are four forms of flexibility. One is two speed Europe. So uh, the second is variable geometry of member states involved in uh, some aspect of this policy. The third is varying forms of expressing solidarities. And the last form is the temptation to reducing rights granted to migrants. So in order, and this is currently uh, the temptation which is more used and it, is, it also appears within the, the European Pact on uh, Asylum and Migration. Uh, so it would be very important uh, to, in order to try avoid reducing rights granted to asylum seekers and migrants to try to uh, uh, Im imagine what could be other forms of flexibility. The first form, so to speed Europe, it has already, it has always existed. If you think of the Schengen area, for instance, uh, members, mem member states who want to join the Schengen area need to meet certain requirements in order to get into it. So, and uh, we can think as regards uh, asylum issues and rescue uh, of uh, migrant at sea uh, of uh, informal arrangement uh, which happened uh, in 2019 between France, Germany, Italy, in order to uh, distribute uh, people who were rescued at sea. So, and the hope was that uh, this good example of uh, solidarity could progressively expand to other member states. So in reality, it was not the case. So. Uh, we have also to, to, to consider other forms of uh, solidarity, variable geometry. Uh, variable geometry also has always existed in the EU and specifically in uh, justice and home affairs. Uh, so only member states willing to accept uh, solidarity uh, would be uh, part of it. Uh, but here again, there are some difficulties with this uh, option, which is that uh, the useful effect of uh, this kind of solidarity would be reduced if only a limited number of member states are part in, the, in a group of solidarity. And secondly, uh, uh, even uh, uh, migrants could compare, make comparison uh, between uh, the situation inside the solidarity group uh, as regards their rights, the rights of the rights of the rights. them, and outside the solidarity group. And so it could require... We don't have much time, it's a nice like a girl to give some time for the general discussion with the audience. Okay. So we should be... Uh, uh, Shorter. Uh, then, 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 then. Oh, there is a decode. I'm sorry. Uh, 
so this, this last form of expressing solidarity and flex through flexibility is considering various forms of solidarity, uh, for instance, contribution to IASO or uh, Frontex uh, with uh, expert uh, development assistance in uh, countries of origin or a contribution in security and defense operation, which, which aim to uh, stabilize a country and to reduce uh, push factors uh, for migration to, to the EU. However, this, uh, this way of uh, solidarity, uh, flexibility is also difficult because uh, you need in this uh, situation to find a system of equivalence between the various forms of solidarities. And this is something which is difficult. So, uh, we are in the current situation where uh, the first aim of uh, the reform of the asylum system in 2016 was to find more harmonization between member states. And in reality, we are ending up with uh, more flexibility. It is certainly, uh, it's not very satisfying, but uh, it seems to be the only way out at the moment. And uh, yes, uh, before, before uh, disintegration, because uh, we are threatened by a disintegration process in the European immigration policy. Corinne, uh, I will give the floor now to Emmanuel Comte, who is a senior researcher at CEDOP and also one of the EU IDEA experts. Emmanuel, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Blanca, and thank you very much, um, Director General, uh, for uh, participating in, in this event and uh, bringing your, your point of view to our reflections. And it's very welcome, actually, because the International Organization for Migration is particularly relevant to the, to the reflection we have had inside this uh, project on different frameworks of cooperation on migration in, in Europe. And actually, we have barely uh, reflected upon the contribution, the role that the International Organization for Migration could have in the European context. It's, a, it's an organization that is outside the EU uh, framework and yet is in charge of important functions at the European level in the management of, uh, of migration. So it's, it's an organization that has a long, uh, a long history. It started actually in the, in the early 50s to promote emigration from Europe. Yeah at the time when the, the, the main problem was inside Europe. And now it's, it's an organization that is mostly in charge of migration flows between Europe and the rest of, of the world. So to be brief and, uh, and to the point, uh, I would like to, to ask you, uh, Mr. Director General, what, uh, what you think can be the contribution, the distinct contribution of uh, IOM? to uh, the predicaments, uh, the various problems you have mentioned inside, uh, in Europe, about migration. Um, can the IOM contribute to uh, reconnecting uh, reality and perception, to uh, prevent uh, a migration scare in, in Europe, uh, reduce this uh, tendency of European states to resort to pushbacks, and what, uh, to what extent the fact that the IOM is outside uh, the EU system while fulfilling important migration functions in Europe is relevant. So um, in a nutshell, what can the IOM do and how its particular uh, setup uh, is, uh, is strategic uh, for uh, to carry out its functions. Thank you, Emmanuel. 
for being so clear and so uh, to the point. I think that the, the question is very clear and, and extremely relevant. Let me now give the floor to Katarina, the last EU expert, to raise the last comments, questions. Katarina? Yes. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Uh, let me just start by thanking the Director General for his really insightful and, and nuanced uh, remarks uh, when it comes to uh, migration and uh, asylum pressures. And in particular, I was uh, very pleased to hear you uh, stressing the importance of, of tackling really the root drivers and uh, underlying causes of this migration and asylum pressures. And indeed, I would say that, that here in Europe, within the European Union and among member states, uh, we should perhaps better acknowledge that the pressures in migration and asylum that we face are ultimately symptoms rather than actual underlying uh, causes of crisis, and that we need to invest more in cooperation both among EU member states, uh, within the broader supranational EU institutions, and, 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 and then uh, together with other multilateral forums on, on moving beyond managing uh, those symptoms and, and really uh, being able to, to tackle, um, and ideally, I would say, uh, prevent uh, the conflict escalatory processes and breakdowns of societal um, uh, peace um, and contracts that ultimately today lead to these pressures uh, in migration and asylum towards the EU. As Although, like you said, again, it's also important to, to remember, and I think this could also help in, in shaping those perceptions to acknowledge that uh, indeed uh, most of migrants, displaced people, do not ever uh, uh, get to Europe uh, and, and don't even actually aim at that. Uh, and, and this is really important. But to keep this very short, I would just like to ask you um, a little bit to elaborate on, on the external dimension um, that you also uh, spoke about. Um, and, and beyond kind of the, the border management that the EU has uh, in recent years, indeed, as you mentioned, strengthened, uh, one, of the, one of the kind of um, emphasis in, in the EU's migration and um, asylum uh, policies has been to partner up in, in diver diverse ways, uh, both EU member states, but, but increasingly also the EU as a whole with uh, different third parties um, um, these, um, that, that are located closer to the places and, and uh, homes of origin of migrants and asylum seekers. Um, there are also, however, although this has in the short term kind of contributed to, to lowering those pressures towards the EU, uh, there are some challenges related to human rights um, and, and, and through that related to the EU's normative agency and legitimacy as an agent as um, these partnerships have, have added heterogeneity and ambiguity when it comes to, uh, in the end, the EU's compliance um, with human rights. On the other hand, one could also argue that there are nowadays, especially in the in the light of the geopolitical uh, shift that we see in the world, uh, some more direct threats to the EU in this over reliance on these external partnerships. We've already seen uh, some third parties uh, using the EU's um, lack of kind of agreement on on the internal aspects and the reliance on these external aspects. To, to pressure the EU and, and even threaten the EU. Um, and, and given the uh, intensifying geopolitical uh, landscape, probably these kind of efforts will not soon stop. Um, so, so yes, uh, in, in short, I would like to, to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on, on how you see the potential and the future, but, but also the challenges in this uh, reliance uh, 
increasingly that has taken place on this uh, external uh, dimension also when it comes to helping migrants and asylum seekers uh, by the EU and its member states. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Katarina. Now I'll, I'll give the floor back to Mr. Vitorino. But meanwhile, you can, from, I mean, we, I invite the audience to participate by uh, uh, writing uh, questions, remarks, comments uh, through the chat. So, Mr. Vitorino, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the uh, contributions of the three uh, experts. I will try to be very brief in my uh, replies. Uh, what is the difference that I can make to the uh, European debate? I think that uh, uh, our utmost contribution is to provide evidence for policy formulation. The best way of uh, addressing misperceptions is to deconstruct, deconstruct the myth and the manipulation that uh, so frequently uh, occurs on migration issues and providing with the figures, the facts and the evidence that can sustain a, a policy. That's what we try to do, not just in Europe, but uh, worldwide, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, sometimes I have the fear that it's much easier to believe in a, a simplistic uh, speech than uh, to uh, deep dive into the reality and the facts that we can uh, provide. It's an ongoing process. Uh, definitely, if you read the social media, you will see all the myth, all the manipulation that goes around migration that uh, fuels the hate speech, uh, racism, uh, discrimination, and uh, the weapons we have to fight against uh, those uh, hate speeches and uh, those manipulations is uh, to make available in a wider way the evidence and the facts and help those who are in good faith to look to reality as it stands and now and not how it is sold to, to them. Uh, in terms of uh, institutional cooperation, well, we have uh, uh, an, an institutional cooperation with the European Union in a number of humanitarian crises, in a number of uh, development challenges, in a number of areas where the top priority is to address the new drivers of mobility, which are not just conflict as it used to be, but each time more and more we see that uh, there are uh, impacts on human mobility from climate change. I can say that uh, from the 50 million, 50 million people displaced last year, probably 30 million were linked with disasters that have a strong connection with uh, climate change and with the fact that uh, instability and security is spreading in a number of areas in the world where uh, non-state actors, uh, terrorist groups, uh, have gained control over important parts of the territory of countries, like, for instance, in the Sahel or more recently in uh, northern uh, Mozambique. In addressing these challenges, we have a, a tripartite cooperation between the European Union, the African Union, and the United Nations, in Libya, for instance. And uh, this, uh, in, from the, the UN side, uh, the participation on that tripartite cooperation is mainly from uh, uh, UNHCR and IOM. And this kind of uh, tripartite cooperation makes the UN system play the role of an honest broker between countries of origin and countries of transit and countries of destination in a specific migratory route, which is the African towards Europe migratory route. And we believe that there is space and opportunities to expand this tripartite approach to other regions in the world, most particularly uh, to the Sahel, where definitely 
we are confronted with the uh, major impacts of uh, political instability, of insecurity, of uh, climate change, of poverty, of lack of access to social services that are responsible for roughly more than 2 million displaced people just last year. And that is definitely a trigger of mobility, putting into danger the integrity and the fundamental rights of the people on the, on the move. So there you have two examples. Evidence-based, providing the reality as much as we can for those who are in good faith to use it in their own political debates. And on the other side, being engaged in addressing uh, the needs of those people who are on the move on the basis of a, a cooperation that brings together uh, countries of origin, transit and destination, with uh, the United Nations playing the role of an honest uh, broker. Mm. On the issue that uh, was raised concerning uh, the situation of partnerships with uh, third countries, I would like to recall you that 80% of asylum seekers in the world are in uh, low and middle income countries. They are not in wealthy countries. And those countries have to cope with the challenge of hosting and supporting those people that are escaping from death of, uh, to their lives, uh, running away from conflict, uh, from civil wars. And uh, so it's the role of the international community as a whole, and of the United Nations in particular, to support those countries that host the vast majority of refugees and asylum seekers uh, world, uh, worldwide. And uh, in our own perspective, now I speak for IOM, our engagement is above all with uh, uh, the local authorities and the local NGOs. We have quite a large number of projects of community stabilization, where we try to help the communities to build resilience, and to find durable solutions for their future. And this work is done largely in close coordination with local actors, because the local actors are the ones who know best the field, and the local actors are the ones who know better what are the needs and what is the best way of addressing those needs, the anxieties and the fears of the local communities in order to guarantee their stability and also the reintegration of those who uh, have come back from migration because they have been rejected as migrants, uh, especially uh, in the framework of the voluntary humanitarian uh, returns. And we do that in close coordination with the European Union, with European Union member states, and with the funding that the European Union provides for such, uh, such activities. And uh, I would conclude by sharing Katarina's view that uh, it is totally unacceptable that countries for geopolitical, reason, geopolitical reasons might uh, uh, manipulate and instrumentalize migrants, putting at risk their safety and their well-being. Unfortunately, recently we have seen these kind of examples in the external borders of the European Union with uh, uh, Belarus. And uh, we are ready and we have made ourselves available to give humanitarian assistance to those migrants that are in a sort of a no man's land between the pressure of the both countries at the border. And to conclude, I would emphasize that of course, uh, strengthening the controls of the external borders, it's relevant, very relevant. It's necessary that the strengthening of the control of the external borders is done in full alignment with international obligations and international humanitarian law. But I would like to recall you that uh, more than 60% of those migrants that are in an irregular situation in the European Union member states did not 
enter the European Union irregularly. They are what the experts call overstayers. Those are people who arrive legally and then they stay beyond the limit of their authorized stay. So the, to address the challenge of the, those migrants in irregular situation, uh, the answer is not on the external border. The answer is uh, in the regulation of mm. the market and in guaranteeing that those people, whether they have access to the uh, regularization process or if they are not allowed to stay in the countries of destination, they have a safe and dignity, dignified way of returning back to their countries of origin and being reintegrated in those uh, countries uh, of origin. So there you have uh, um, my, my reaction to the questions that have been raised. And I want to thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Vitorino. Uh, it has been extremely interesting and an honor to be able to, to listen to you and to discuss with you the results and the question raised by our EU IDEA project. Let me recall that the key question of the EU IDEA project was whether, how much, and what form of differentiation is not only compatible, but also conducive to more effective, cohesive, and democratic EU. And here, of course, in the field of migration, the question of responsibility sharing is key. And it was key, and it was one of the main challenges during the um, the refugee reception crisis in 2015. You raise another very important issue, which is the relationship between perceptions and reality. And here, of course, and as you explain it very well, there is a clear mismatch. And the question would be how to reconcile these perceptions and this uh, reality, and how to address both. Uh, you said that policies have to address both, both, but the question would be as well, what is the role of policies in also uh, co in contributing or constructing this, uh, this myth or these uh, narratives. This is something we are starting to, to study here at CEDOP with another Horizon 2020 project on uh, narratives on migration. And we are precisely looking at the nexus between narratives and, uh, and policies to be able or at least to contribute to this uh, deconstruction of this myth, which determine not only public opinion, but also policies themselves. So here we are. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you as well to Corinne, uh, Emmanuel, and Katarina. It has been a, a really very insightful uh, discussion. Uh, there are many things, many challenges still to discuss, and, to, uh, and there are many um, questions to, to be raised still, but this is uh, just the beginning at the end of the project. Uh, thank you very much to all. Thanks again, uh, Mr. Vitorino. And, uh, uh, we hope to continue the discussion very soon. Bye.